Lesson 7 for November 10 through to 16, When Conflicts Arise, Sabbath Afternoon, November 10. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come to open your word again. And as we do, we realise that as we're listening, as we're reading your word, that we all come from different countries, different cultures, different backgrounds. And we come together in unity to worship you, to find out what you want for each of us individually and want for each of us as human beings. We pray that as we open your word this week, that your Holy Spirit will guide us and that in our daily walk with you this week, that we may know that you are the God who not only created us, but provided salvation and provides us with the strength and the grace that we need for our daily activities. Bless us each one, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Galatians chapter 3, verses 27 and 28. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Let's read that again, Galatians three twenty-seven and 28. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. One of the most difficult tasks of any Christian community is to maintain unity when differences of opinion arise on matters pertaining to the identity and mission of the church. These differences can lead to devastating consequences. Today's Christian communities are no different from those we see in the New Testament. People are people, and differences, even over important points, will come. Early Christians faced some conflicts arising from perceived interpersonal prejudices and from serious differences of interpretations of key Old Testament stories and practices. These conflicts could have destroyed the church in its infancy, had it not been for thoughtful apostles and leaders who sought the guidance of the Holy Spirit and the Scriptures to resolve these tensions. A few weeks ago, we studied how the early church experienced church unity. This week, we look at how the early church solved the inner conflicts that undermined its unity and threatened its survival. What were these conflicts? How were they resolved? And what can we today learn from those experiences? Sunday, November 11. Ethnic Prejudices Question. Read Acts chapter 6, verse 1. What issue in the early church caused people to complain about what appeared to be the unfair and unequitable distribution of food to widows? Acts chapter 6, beginning at verse 1. Now in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists, because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. Some early Christians appeared to be prejudiced against the widows of Greek heritage in their midst, and provided them with less food than the widows of Hebrew heritage. This perceived favouritism caused a rift in the early community of believers. Whether or not the favouritism was real, the text does not say. It says only that some people believed that it was. This conflict threatened the church's unity very early on. How fascinating that ethnic division was seen so quickly in the church. Question. Read Acts chapter 6, verses 2 through to 6. What were the simple steps taken by the early church to solve this misunderstanding? Beginning at verse 2. Then the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, It is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, brethren, 
Seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch, whom they set before the apostles. And, when they had prayed, they laid hands on them. The early church was growing rapidly, and this growth brought increasingly heavy burdens on the apostles. The appointment of these seven men, traditionally called deacons, although the New Testament does not call them as such, relieved the tension in the Jerusalem church, and allowed for the involvement of more people in the ministry of the church. The apostles listened carefully to the complaints of Greek-speaking believers and asked them for a solution. The selection of the seven men to become associates of the apostles was left to this group, and they recommended seven disciples, all of them from Greek-speaking heritage. These men were said to be of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. That was in Acts chapter 6 and verse 3. The ministry of the apostles which until then had been both to preach the word of God and to distribute food to widows, was divided into two groups, each doing an equally valuable ministry for the proclamation of the gospel. Luke uses the same word ministry or service, diakonia, to refer to both the ministry of the apostles in preaching the word, in verse 4, and to the ministry of the deacons in distributing food, in verse 1. So, to finish the day, what significance do you see in the fact that the leaders called many of the believers together in verse 2 in order to try to work out a solution? Verse 2 read, Then the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, It is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Monday, November 12, The Conversion of Gentiles The conversion of Gentiles to the Gospel of Jesus Christ is an event in the book of Acts that sets the stage for the greatest conflict in the life of the early church, one that would threaten its existence and mission. Question, read Acts chapter 10, verses 1 through to 23. What elements in this passage indicate that the Holy Spirit was at work in the hearts of many people to prepare the way for Gentiles to receive the gospel? Acts chapter 10, beginning at verse 1. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian Regiment, a devout man and one who feared God with all his household, who gave alms generously to the people and prayed to God always. About the ninth hour of the day he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius. And when he observed him, he was afraid and said, what is it, Lord? So he said to him, Your prayers and your arms have come up for a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa and send for Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodging with Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the sea. He will tell you what you must do. And when the angel who spoke to him had departed, Cornelius called two of his household servants and a devout soldier from among those who waited on him continually. So, when he had explained all these things to them, he sent them to Joppa. The next day, as they went on their journey and drew near the city, Peter went up on the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. Then he became very hungry and wanted to eat. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven opened and an object like a great sheet bound at the four corners descending to him and let down to the earth. In it were all kinds of four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and birds of the air. And a voice came to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, 
Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything common or unclean. And a voice spoke to him again the second time. What God has cleansed you must not call common. This was done three times, and the object was taken up into heaven again. Now, while Peter wondered within himself what this vision which he had seen meant, behold, the men who had been sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate. And they called and asked whether Simon, whose surname was Peter, was lodging there. While Peter thought about the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are seeking you. Arise, therefore, go down, and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. Then Peter went down to the men who had been sent to him from Cornelius, and said, Yes, I am he whom you seek. For what reason have you come? And they said, Cornelius the centurion, a just man, one who fears God and has a good reputation among all the nation of the Jews, was divinely instructed by a holy angel to summon you to his house and to hear words from you. Then he invited them in and lodged them. On the next day, Peter went away with them, and some brethren from Joppa accompanied him. The vision must have seemed so bizarre to Peter. He was shocked by it because, as a faithful Jew, he had never partaken of unclean or defiled foods, as the law required. Actually, we'll look at uh, several texts here. First of all, uh, what it says in Leviticus chapter 11. And it's a long chapter, but it gives some definitions of foods that are permitted and forbidden beginning at verse 1 of Leviticus 1. Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying to them, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, These are the animals which you may eat among all the animals that are on the earth. Among the animals, whatever divides the hoof, having cloven hooves and chewing the cud, that you may eat. Nevertheless, these you shall not eat among those that chew the cud or those that have cloven hooves. The camel, because it chews the cud but does not have cloven hooves, is unclean to you. The rock hyrax, because it chews the cud but does not have cloven hooves, is unclean to you. The hare, because it chews the cud but does not have cloven hooves, is unclean to you. And the swine, though it divides the hoof, having cloven hooves, yet does not chew the cud, is unclean to you. Their flesh you shall not eat, and their carcasses you shall not touch. They are unclean to you. These you may eat of all that are in the water. Whatever in the water has fins and scales, whether in the seas or in the rivers, that you may eat. But all in the seas or in the rivers that do not have fins and scales, all that move in the water or any living thing which is in the water, they are an abomination to you. They shall be an abomination to you, you shall not eat their flesh, but you shall regard their carcasses as an abomination. Whatever in the water does not have fins or scales, that shall be an abomination to you. And these you shall regard as an abomination among the birds. They shall not be eaten, they are an abomination. The eagle, the vulture, the buzzard, the kite, and the falcon, after its kind, Every raven after its kind, the ostrich, the short-eared owl, the seagull, and the hawk after its kind, the little owl, the fisher owl, and the screech owl, the white owl, the jackdaw, and the carrion vulture, the stork, the heron after its kind, the hoopy, and the bat, all flying insects that creep on all fours shall be an abomination to you. Yet these you may eat of every flying insect that creeps on all fours, those which have jointed legs above their feet, with which to leap on the earth. These you may eat, the locust after its kind, the destroying locust after its kind, the cricket after its kind, and the grasshopper after its kind. But all other flying insects which have four feet shall be an abomination to you. By these you shall become unclean. Whoever touches the carcass of any of them shall be unclean until even, 
Whoever carries part of the carcass of any of these shall wash his clothes and be unclean until even. The carcass of any animal which divides the foot, but is not cloven-hoofed, or does not chew the cud, is unclean to you. Every one who touches it shall be unclean, and whatever goes on its paws, after all kinds of animals that go on all fours, these are unclean to you. Whoever touches any such carcass shall be unclean until evening. Whoever carries any such carcass shall wash his clothes and be unclean until evening. It is unclean to you. These also shall be unclean to you among the creeping things that creep on the earth. The mole, the mouse, the, li the large lizard after its kind, the gecko, the monitor lizard, the sand reptile, the sand lizard and the chameleon. These are unclean to you among all that creep. Whoever touches them when they are dead shall be unclean until evening. Anything on which any of them falls when they are dead shall be unclean, whether it is an, any item of wood or clothing or skin or sack, whatever item it is in which any work is done, it must be put in water, and it shall be unclean until evening. Then it shall be clean." Any earthen vessel into which any of them falls you shall break, and whatever is in it shall be unclean. In such a vessel any edible food upon which water falls becomes unclean, and any drink that may be drunk from it becomes unclean. And everything on which a part of any such carcass falls shall be unclean. Whether it is an oven or cooking stove it shall be broken down, for they are unclean and shall be unclean to you. Nevertheless, a spring or a cistern in which there is plenty of water shall be clean, but whatever touches any such carcass becomes unclean. And, if a part of any such carcass falls on any planting seed which is to be sown, it remains unclean. But if water is put on the seed, and if a part of any such carcass falls on it, it becomes unclean to you. And, if any animal which you may eat dies, he who touches its carcass shall be unclean until evening." He who eats of its carcass shall wash his clothes and be unclean until evening. He also who carries its carcass shall wash his clothes and be unclean until evening. Ezekiel 4 verse 14 reads, So I said, Ah, Lord God, indeed, I have never defiled myself from my youth till now. I have never eaten what died of itself or was torn by beasts, nor has abominable flesh ever come into my mouth. And Daniel 1 verse 8. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. However, the intent of this vision was not about diet, but about the barriers between Jews and Gentiles that were hindering the spread of the gospel. Such barriers were at least as prevalent in the ancient world as they are today. During the first decades, Christianity was basically made up of Jews who had accepted Jesus as the promised Messiah of the Old Testament prophecies. These early believers in Jesus were faithful Jews who obeyed the law as they had been taught. They did not consider the gospel of Jesus Christ as having erased or abolished the Old Testament prescriptions, as we read in Matthew five seventeen to 20 Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfil. For assuredly I say to you, till heaven or earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments, and teaches men so, shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you, that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Question, read Acts chapter 10, verses 28, 29, 34 and 35. What did Peter understand was the meaning of the vision he received in Joppa? What led him to this interpretation? And we begin with Acts chapter 10, verses 28 to 29. Then he said to them, You know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company with or go to one of another nation, 
but God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Therefore I came without objection as soon as I was sent for. I ask then, for what reason have you sent for me? And verses 34 to 35. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality. But in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. What we see happening in Acts is that the Holy Spirit had prepared the way for Gentiles to be received into the fellowship of the Christian community. And they could do this without having to be circumcised and become Jews first. What convinced Peter and his friends that this was indeed God's will was the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on Cornelius and his household in a similar way to what the disciples of Jesus had experienced on the day of Pentecost. We read about this in Acts 10, to 47 While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word, and those of the circumcision who believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also, for they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then Peter answered, can any one forbid water that these should not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? If the Holy Spirit was given to Gentiles in the same way as it was given to Jews, then it was evident that being circumcised was not a prerequisite to becoming a believer in Jesus as the Messiah. This conclusion set the stage for a major theological conflict among early Christians. Tuesday, November 13. The Spirit is Leading. Reports of what happened in Caesarea with Cornelius soon reached the leaders of the Christian community in Jerusalem, and they asked Peter to give an account of what happened. They were offended by what Peter had done because, according to their Jewish understanding of the law of Moses, faithful Jews were not allowed to eat with Gentiles. Acts 11.3, saying, You went in to uncircumcised men and ate with them? Question. Read Acts chapter 11, verses 4 through to 18. What did Peter say to explain the work of the Holy Spirit and his leading in this event? What was the main point he was making by recounting what had happened? Acts 11, beginning at verse 4. But Peter explained it to them in order from the beginning, saying, I was in the city of Joppa, praying, and in a trance I saw a vision, an object descending like a great sheet, let down from heaven by four corners, and it came to me. When I observed it intently and considered, I saw four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and birds of the air. And I heard a voice saying to me, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But I said, Not so, Lord, for nothing common or unclean has at any time entered my mouth. But the voice answered me again from heaven. What God has cleansed, you must not call common. Now this was done three times, and all were drawn up again into heaven. At that very moment, three men stood before the house where I was, having been sent to me from Caesarea. Then the Spirit told me to go with them, doubting nothing. Moreover, these six brethren accompanied me, and we entered the man's house. And he told us how he had seen an angel standing in his house, who said to him, Send men to Joppa, and call for Simon, whose surname is Peter, who will tell you the words by which you and your household will be saved. And, as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them, as upon us at the beginning. Then I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John indeed baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If therefore God gave him the same gift as he gave us when we believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I 
that I could withstand God. When they heard these things, they became silent, and they glorified God, saying, Then God has also granted to the Gentiles repentance to life. Although some raised questions about the legitimacy of Peter's actions and his decision to baptise these Gentiles, sufficient witnesses in verse 12 certified that the Holy Spirit did indeed manifest his presence in the same way as at Pentecost. The guidance and leading of the Holy Spirit in this case is unassailable and the gift acknowledged. As it says in Acts 11.18, When they heard these things, they became silent, and they glorified God, saying, Then God has also granted to the Gentiles repentance to life. Question. Read Acts chapter 11, verses 19 through to 24. What happened next in the life of the early church? Acts 11, beginning at 19. Now those who were scattered after the persecution that arose over Stephen travelled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus and Antioch preaching the word to no one but the Jews only. But some of them were men from Cyprus and Cyrene, who, when they had come to Antioch, spoke to the Hellenists, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned to the Lord. Then news of these things came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent out Barnabas to go as far as Antioch. When he came and had seen the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged them all that with purpose of heart they should continue with the Lord. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and a great many people were added to the Lord. Perhaps some in Jerusalem thought that what happened with Cornelius and his household would be an exception and that such an experience would not be repeated. But that's not what the Holy Spirit intended. As the disciples of Jesus scattered beyond Jerusalem and Judea because of the persecution that arose after Stephen's death, recorded in Acts chapter 8 verse 1, and went to Samaria, Phoenicia, Cyprus and Antioch, subsequently more and more Gentiles accepted Jesus as their saviour. Acts 8 verse 1 reads, Now Saul was consenting to his death. At that time a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. This is what Jesus had predicted in Acts 1 verse 8. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. As wonderful as this influx of Gentiles was, if we put ourselves in the place of these early Jewish believers, it's not hard to see how they weren't quite sure how to react. And so to finish today, How might we ourselves be holding on to narrow views of the church and of our message that could hamper our witness? Wednesday, November 14, the Jerusalem Council. Question, read Acts chapter 15, verses 1 and 2, and Galatians chapter 2, verses 11 through to 14. What are the two issues that cause serious conflict in the early church? Acts 15, beginning at verse 1, And certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, Unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Therefore, when Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and dispute with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about this question. And in Galatians 2, verses 11 through to 14. Now when Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him to his face, because he was to be blamed. 
For before certain men came from James, he would eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. And the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him, so that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before them all, If you, being a Jew, live in the manner of the Gentiles and not of the Jews, why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews? The threat to church unity faced by early Christians was real and difficult. Some Jewish Christians thought that salvation was possible only for those who belonged to the covenant people of God, and this implied that circumcision was a requirement. And, as part of a faithful lifestyle, these Jewish believers also believed that they were to avoid any contacts with Gentiles that could possibly thwart their own salvation. The Jews had very strict traditions in regard to their association with Gentiles. These traditions quickly became a stumbling block for the new Christian community when the apostles began to reach out to Gentiles who wished to become followers of Jesus. Because the Messiah is the saviour of God's covenant people, as predicted in the Old Testament, weren't Gentiles supposed to become Jews first and then follow the same covenant rules if they wanted to be saved? Question. Read Acts chapter 15, verses 3 through to 20. What were some issues presented during the Jerusalem Council? Acts 15, beginning at verse 3. So, being sent on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenicia and Samaria, describing the conversion of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy to all the brethren. And when they had come to Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they reported all things that God had done with them. But some of the sect of the Pharisees who believed rose up, saying, It is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. Now the apostles and elders came together to consider this matter, and when there had been much dispute, Peter rose up and said to them, Men and brethren, you know that a good while ago God chose among us that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. So God, who knows the heart, acknowledged them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us and made no distinction between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why do you test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ we shall be saved in the same manner as they. Then all the multitude kept silent and listened to Barnabas, and Paul, declaring how many miracles and wonders God had worked through them among the Gentiles. And, after they had become silent, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, listen to me. Simon has declared how God at the first visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And with this the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written. After this I will return and will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will rebuild its ruins, and I will set it up, so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord. Even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who does all these things. Known to God from eternity are all his works. Therefore I judge that we should not trouble those from among the Gentiles who are turning to God but that we write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from things strangled, and from blood. For Moses has had throughout many generations those who preach him in every city, being read in the synagogues every Sabbath. Then it pleased the apostles and elders, with the whole church, to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, who was also named Barsabas, and Silas, leading men among the brethren. 
The issue here was rooted in conflicts over deeply held interpretations of the Old Testament stories regarding circumcision and relationship with Gentiles. As apostles, elders and delegates from Antioch sat together, it seemed the discussion went on for a long time without any resolution. But then Peter, Barnabas and Paul made speeches. Peter's speech alluded to the visionary revelation that God gave him and to the gift of the Holy Spirit, which opened the way for the mission to the Gentiles. Then Paul and Barnabas shared their stories of what God had done through them for the Gentiles. As a result, many eyes were opened to the new truth. Said Peter in Acts 15.11, We believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ we shall be saved in the same manner as they. Centuries of long-held tradition were unravelling in light of the gospel. And so to finish the day, was there ever a time you changed your mind about how you understood a deeply held belief? What did you learn from the experience that could perhaps help you when you might again come to question your understanding of a belief? Thursday, November 15, A Difficult Solution It took some level of trust from the church at Antioch to send representatives to Jerusalem in order to seek the best solution to their conflict. However, after hours of discussion between the apostles and elders, James, the brother of Jesus, who appears to be the leader of the assembly, made a judgment about what should be done. And we read that in Acts chapter 15, verses 13 to 20. And after they had become silent, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, listen to me. Simon has declared how God at the first visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name, and with this the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written. After this I will return, and will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will rebuild its ruins, and I will set it up, so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who does all these things. Known to God from eternity are all his works. Therefore, I judge that we should not trouble those from among the Gentiles who are turning to God, but that we write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from things strangled, and from blood. Clearly, the council decided that Gentiles do not need to become Jewish converts, obeying all aspects of the ceremonial laws, including circumcision, in order to become Christians. Question. Read Amos 9, verses 11 and 12, and Jeremiah 12, 14 to 16. What predictions did these Old Testament prophets make regarding Israel's neighbouring nations? Amos 9, beginning at verse 11. On that day I will raise up the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down, and repair its damages. I will raise up its ruins, and rebuild it as in the days of old, that they may possess the remnant of Edom, and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who does this thing. And Jeremiah chapter 12 Beginning at verse 14, Thus says the Lord, Against all my evil neighbours who touch the inheritance which I have caused my people Israel to inherit, behold, I will pluck them out of their land and pluck out the house of Judah from among them. Then it shall be, after I have plucked them out, that I will return and have compassion on them and bring them back, every one to his heritage and every one to his land." And it shall be, if they will learn carefully the ways of my people, to swear by my name, as the Lord lives, as they taught my people to swear by Baal, then they shall be established in the midst of my people. 
While James quotes from Amos 9, we see allusions to the salvation of the nations in other Old Testament prophets. It was God's intention all along to save the entire world through Israel's witness and experience. In fact, God's call to Abraham included a blessing for all nations through him and his descendants in Genesis 12, verses 1 to 3. Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation, I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. The leading of the Holy Spirit, the ministry of Peter, Barnabas and Paul among the Gentiles, and the conversion of many Gentiles were evidences that could not be set aside. These testimonies helped leaders of the Christian community in Jerusalem realize that many Old Testament prophecies were now being fulfilled. In fact, God already had given laws guiding the presence of Gentiles in Israel and what restrictions applied to them, and they're described in two whole chapters in Leviticus chapter 17 and 18. James also referred to these laws in his decision in Acts 15.29. That you abstain from things offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled, and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourselves from these things... You will do well. Farewell. It became obvious to everyone that God was calling Gentiles to join his people and receive salvation in Jesus. The guidance of the Holy Spirit gave them a deeper understanding of the scripture and revealed to them crucial truths that they had not seen before. Acts 15 verses 30 to 35 tells the response of the people in Antioch to what was decided in Jerusalem. And that reads, So when they were sent off, they came to Antioch, and when they had gathered the multitude together, they delivered the letter. When they had read it, they rejoiced over its encouragement. Now Judas and Silas themselves, being prophets also, exhorted and strengthened the brethren with many words. And after they had stayed there for a time, They were sent back with greetings from the brethren to the apostles. However, it seemed good to Silas to remain there. Paul and Barnabas also remained in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord, with many others also. In the NIV, the verse 31 reads, The people were glad for its encouraging message. We see here in Acts a powerful example of how the early church through submission to the Word of God, along with the mindset of love, unity and trust, could, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, avert what could have been a major crisis of unity. And so to finish today, what does this account teach us about how important it is for us not only to listen to what others are saying, but to consider that they might be right, even when What they say is not exactly what we want to hear. Friday, November 16. From the book The Acts of the Apostles, written by Ellen White, page 196 and 197, we read, The council which decided this case was composed of apostles and teachers who had been prominent in raising up the Jewish and Gentile Christian churches, with chosen delegates from various places. Elders from Jerusalem and deputies from Antioch were present, and the most influential churches were represented. The council moved in accordance with the dictates of enlightened judgment and with the dignity of a church established by the divine will. As a result of their deliberations, they all saw that God himself had answered the question at issue by bestowing upon the Gentiles the Holy Ghost, and they realized that it was their part to follow the guidance of the Spirit. The entire body of Christians was not called to vote upon the question— 
the apostles and elders, men of influence and judgment, framed and issued the decree, which was thereupon generally accepted by the Christian churches. Not all, however, were pleased with the decision. There was a faction of ambitious and self-confident brethren who disagreed with it. These men assumed to engage in the work on their own responsibility. They indulged in much murmuring and fault-finding, proposing new plans and seeking to pull down the work of the men whom God had ordained to teach the gospel message. From the first, the churches had such obstacles to meet, and ever will have, till the close of time. And that brings us to our two discussion questions for this week. 1. What steps toward the resolution of conflicts found in the accounts we looked at this week can be applied to your church community if and when disagreements arise? Though one issue the church was dealing with here was theological, what can we learn from these accounts that can help the church when cultural, political or ethnic issues threaten unity? What important principles can we take away from what we have seen? 2. Look again at the Ellen White quote above. Despite the positive outcome, some were still not satisfied. What lesson should we take away from this sad reality? And to summarise this week's lesson. The early church was threatened by internal conflicts over a number of issues that could have had a devastating effect on it. We saw the way that the church, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, and submission to the word of God, was able to resolve these conflicts and avert schisms. Inside Story our mission story this week is titled Praying for Missing Sheep, and it's by Lloyd Perrin. The church that I pastor in the U.S. state of Oregon has an official membership of 491 people, but only 38% of those members are active, a number that inches up to 44% if you include elderly members who are housebound because of physical or mental disabilities. That means 56% of our members are inactive, a figure that I haven't found to be unusual during my decades of pastoring churches in the United States. The problem is not limited to U.S. churches. Worldwide, nearly half of all people baptised into the Seventh-day Adventist Church over the past 50 years have ended up leaving. But the church has an obligation to shepherd the flock. The Apostle Peter says in 1 Peter 5 two, Shepherd the flock of God which is among you. So we started going through our membership records at the Milton Seventh-day Adventist Church in Milton Freewater, Oregon. I will distribute a list of these missing members to each church officer. We will pray daily for each missing member by name and ask God to help us reconnect with them. Surprises abounded when I gave a similar prayer challenge at my previous church in Spokane, Washington. About three weeks after we started to pray, I received a letter from a woman who had left the church 15 years earlier. The woman had quit church after failing to return a storybook from the church library. She had moved to another state, and she wrote, had been too lazy to find a way to return the book. But guilt had gnawed at her heart and then grown into a cancer that poisoned her relationship with God. The woman wrote that she had suddenly remembered the book and felt convicted to reach out to the church. She apologised for taking the book and enclosed $50 to cover the book's cost and 15 years of interest on its value. I called up the woman immediately and learned that her sense of conviction had begun growing only when our church had started to pray, 1,500 miles or 2,400 kilometres away. I put her in touch with her local Adventist pastor and she became an active member of that church. Soon, we also will pray for missing Milton members. We need to find our missing sheep and invite them home. Lloyd Perrin is senior pastor at the Milton Seventh-day Adventist Church in Milton Freewater, Oregon, 
and the Blue Mountain Valley Mission Church in Athena in Oregon. You have been listening to a reading of the Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide by Dr. Percy Harold from Queensland, Australia. This service is brought to you by Hope Channel, the Sabbath School Department and Christian Services for the Blind. Remember, God is always faithful.